Well, today our message is entitled Zero to Hero. And today, something interesting is today our society is fascinated with the idea of heroes. Just recently, movie critics have labeled this present age of movies as the hero era. Because more than ever, have they been, been, been creating hero movies to watch. And just recently, they came out with a movie called Marvel Civil War. If you haven't seen it, your children might know about it. But this one movie, in three days, it said that they had the fifth largest box office weekend. And it earned 100, 181.79 million dollars. And it's only been out for about two or three weeks, and it has earned one billion dollars. The world we're living in today is fascinated with heroes. And many believe the reason for this is, is because inside of each and every one of us is the desire to be a hero. And as we watch these movies, we like to imagine that we are these heroes. And I have to admit, you know, sometimes when I'm stuck in traffic, when I'm going to Fort Worth or Dallas, you know, I have to admit, sometimes it'd be nice to be a superhero, wouldn't it? I mean, who here wouldn't mind to be able to get out of their car and just fly to work? I mean, think about it. Think of all the gas, the money, the time that you would save if you could fly. And even more, I bet there's, pr there's probably many mothers here who would love to have diaper-changing vision. I want you to imagine it. My mother's out there. Imagine that you, you, you smell that stinky diaper. And just by looking at it, you can change it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? But you know what? I'll be honest. Because I'm not going to get fixated on this fantasy. Because I know soon and very soon when I get to heaven, I will be able to fly. So don't worry. And you please don't try to jump in any vat of super radioactive chemicals. It's not going to work. But one thing that's my greatest desire is my greatest desire is to be a hero for Christ. And, and I don't know about you, but it's my desire to be bold and courageous for the Lord, just like those superheroes. And you know what? I believe that is God's deepest desire for each and every one of us to be bold and courageous for Him. So how do we do that? Well, today I want us to take, I want to take you on a journey through the life of Peter. And I wanted to see through Peter's life how a man who denied Christ three times became a man who was courageous and bold for God. And what happened during this time to transform this coward into a hero? So before we jump in the Bible today, will you join me once again in inviting God's presence into our service? Dearly Father, Lord our God, Lord, how amazing you are. Lord, this morning we just pray that you open our eyes to your truth. And Lord, may we all be heroes for you. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. So this morning, if you can join me in turning to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. Amen. And this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms for those who entered the temple. When seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but I do have I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifting him up, and immediately his feet, his ankle bones, received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people who saw him walking and praising God, they, they knew that it was him who sat begging for alms at the gate beautiful or of the temple. 
and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And this is one of my favorite stories. And as I was researching the story, I wanted to find out a little more about this gate, this gate called Beautiful. And what's interesting is that scholars actually don't know which gate this was in the temple. Because in, their liter in, in all their writings, nowhere does anybody call a gate beautiful. But what they do believe, they believe that this gate is called Nai Kanar. I hope I said that right. If, you know, if you're fluent in Hebrew, you can correct me. But Nai Kanar, and what is believed is the gates in the temple were made of silver and they were plated with gold. But there was one gate that was pure bronze. And what happened was that they wanted to change this gate, but this gate was so beautiful, and they said that it looked like gold, that they never touched it. And so many people believe that this is the gate that this lame man is sitting under. And this gate is so big, it said that it took 20 men to close it at night. So here this man is <clears throat> under the gate beautiful, and Peter comes to him. You know, he's expecting to get money, but he gets something so much better. He gets his legs back. And what's so interesting as it continues, and as we continue to verse 11, <clears throat> and it says that this man is, as we continue, it says this man is leaping and jumping and praising the Lord, and they enter the temple. And during this time, this is one of the times where majority of the Jews would come to the temple to worship God. So they're entering this temple, and, this, and in the sake of time, I can't go through the whole sermon. And I really want to. Verses 11 to, to 26. I really want to go through this. And as I was studying, I was talking to God, and I was like, God, I should preach this. This is a cool sermon. So I want to give you some homework. I know school's almost out. CACS is almost out. Two more days. But I want to give you some homework. I want, I want to challenge you this Sabbath to read verses 11 to 26. And for those of you who are teachers, might ever have to preach, there's a sermon. Free of charge. But continuing, Peter preaches the sermon, which is one of the most powerful sermons. And in verse, or chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, scribes, as well as Ananias the high priest, Caiaphas, Caiaphas John, the, uh, and Alexander, and as many as were the families of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builder, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is one, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now notice what happens next. In verse 13 it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And so what's so interesting about this scene is that Peter and John, many scholars believe that they are in the exact same place that Jesus was when he was um, convicted to go to, to die on the cross. And here we see that not only are they in the same place as Jesus were, but they're surrounded by the exact same people. Here you see, have the whole Sanhedrin. These are the who's who's of Jerusalem, of the Jews. And what's so interesting is, who is Peter and John? What were they? They were fishermen, uneducated, unschooled, and they were before the most wealthy, the, the most wealthy, the most successful, and the most educated men of all Jerusalem. 
And were they scared? No. It said that they marveled at their boldness. And here's one of the most amazing things. That in God's eyes, in God's eyes, it doesn't matter who you are. You can be a zero, but to him, you are his hero. And what is so amazing is we, here we see that Peter is unafraid. But today we're going to look at, was Peter always like this? Was he always bold for Jesus? So what happened? What happened? How did the Peter who denied Jesus three times become the Peter who we see, to, see here today? What transformation happened? And today, we're going to go through three points of Peter's life where he was afraid and see what changes happened to him. And it's my hope that through this journey, you and I can be bold like Peter. So join me and let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to start with verse 23. Verse 23. Matthew 14, verse 23. Matthew 14, verse 23. And you all know the story. This is a story where Jesus is walking on the, wa on the sea. And in verse 23, it says, And we had sent the multitudes away. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when I read this, I, I, can't, I can't help but imagine. You know, sometimes I feel like we read the Bible and we kind of brush over it. What were they in the middle of? A storm. And Peter said, if that's you, let me come out. And I, oh man, what do I do to be there? I can't imagine what it must have been like when Peter got out of the water and he was literally walking on water. And what we got to remember is as he was walking on water, was it calm? Was it peaceful? No. So I, I can't imagine, is, is the wind pushing him to and throw? Or is he having to step over waves? I don't know. But let's go back to the, let's go back to our Bible and see what it says. In verse 30 it says, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was what? He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat <clears throat> came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So what happened? Why did Peter fall? Because he doubted? Exactly. It says that, going back to ver verse 30, it says, But he saw that the wind was boisterous. And what's so interesting is he took his eyes off of Jesus and started to look at his surroundings. And instantly, he be when he began to doubt, he began to do what? Sink. You know, it's interesting when I read this because, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I read this, I'm like, man, I would never do that, right? I would never take my eyes off of Jesus. Don't you know the songs, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I would never do that. But in our own lives, do we do that? You know, with the Christian walk, never in the Bible, if you find it, please let me know, do, are we told that in the Christian walk there will never be problems? There'll never be trials. There'll never be hard times. But what we are told is that when these storms in our life come, that Jesus will be with us. Amen. And so here's one of the most important things, one of the most amazing things, is that when we're in the storm, where are I supposed to be? on Jesus. You know why? Was it Peter's power? Was it him flexing his legs, keeping his legs tight, hard enough or strong enough that kept him above water? No. 
Was it Peter's strength keeping him above water? No, it was God's. And you know what? In our lives, it's exactly the same. No matter what storm, financially, losing a job, family issues, losing a loved one, it's not our strength that keeps us above water, but it's God's. So lesson one for being a hero for Christ is not, by our, it's not our strength that matters, but it's his. Now for the second one, I want us to go to another amazing story. And this story is found in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 And this is, this is an amazing story. This is one of those stories I wish I could be a fly on the wall, you know? And in Luke chapter 9, verses 28, it says, Now it came to pass about the eighth day after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his, of his mission, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what to say. And then it, ha and then it happened. A voice came out of, of the clouds saying, This is my beloved son. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. Verse 34, sorry about that. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days of anything they had seen. I can't imagine what it must have been like. Have you ever woken up, like, have you ever fallen asleep on the couch? and woken up and saying, where am I? Like, this isn't my bed, where, where, where am I? Could you imagine what it must have been like to wake up and see a bright and glistening Jesus with two men you don't know? And what's so interesting, as we see the story, what does Peter do? Does he keep his mouth shut? No, the Bible says not knowing what to sh say, he says something. <laughs> and, and for lack of better words, he puts his foot in his mouth, doesn't he? You know, and it's so interesting as, as we read this story, you know, how many times have we done the same thing? You know? Have you ever been in a situation where, you know, it could be spiritual or it could just be in everyday life where people are asking you to do something and you have no clue what to say? Have you ever been there? Or maybe I'm alone, but, you know, you're in this situation, you have no clue what to say, and without thinking, you say the first thing that pops in your head. And you know, and as the words are coming out, if you could, you would grab them and put them back in, right? But it's too late because they're already out. And I can imagine this is what just happened to Peter, you know? And what's so interesting about this is what did God tell him to do? He says, going back to verse 35, he said, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Do what? Hear him. Hear him. You know, I strongly believe that when we're in situations like this, you know what we need to do? Listen to God. And I'll tell you, you know, I praise God because he's working with all of us, but nine out of 10 times when I keep my mouth shut and I, and I pray a simple prayer and say, Lord, I'm in a situation. I have no clue what I'm doing. Can you help me? Nine out of 10 times, he helps me. And the one out of 10 time, there's something wrong with my heart. So we see here that it's important when we don't know what to say to keep our mouth shut. We know there's something else interesting here. Have you ever been in a situation and thought you knew what was best? You know, have you ever went front, just kept going forward and you didn't even stop to think to pray to God? Have you ever done that? 
You know, it reminds me of a time I was following up with some Bible study interests. And I, I was bringing them some Bible studies. And I went to the door, and this was, this was like towards the end of it. It was a long day. I was almost done. This was the last interest. And I was coming to their door, and as I was driving up there, I remember I parked. And it, it had been a good day. You know, all the, everything was going good. And I remember in my head saying, man, I got this. I got this. So I put it in park, and I went to get out of my car. And normally, before I get out of the car, I pray. But I told myself, I got this. And whenever you get out of your house or car without praying, you're in trouble. So I open the door, and I go, I, go to the, I go to the front door of this house, and a nice African-American lady opens the door. And we're talking. You know, I give her her, her Bible studies. Everything's going good. But then she begins to ask me questions about the Bible. And she knows it. Like, she's quoting scripture off the top of her mind. She's like, so this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse. I, I just don't understand it. Can you help me? And when I heard it, I was like, yeah, I know that. But guess what? You know when something's on the tip of your tongue? It was on the tip of my tongue. I was like, oh, yeah, I know that. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh. And for two minutes, I was like, you know, well, um, it's, uh, well, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, uh, uh. And finally, I went to the go-to from when you don't know what to say. I said, you know what? That's a good question. Next time when I come, we can study together about it. So I gave her the lessons, and I, you know, I said goodbye, and I walked away. And you know what happened? You know, I, I went, I entered my car, and I was mad. And I was like, God, man, why, why didn't I know the answer? I knew the answer. Why, why didn't it come to my mind? And God gave me the answer. He said, you told me you didn't want me. And I remember as clear as day, I heard this in my heart. It says, your wisdom isn't sufficient enough. My friends, learn a lesson from me. Our, our wisdom is not sufficient enough. And when we're put in situations where we don't know what to say, we don't know what to do, the number one thing to do is to ask God. Because I promise you, He knows what to do. All we have to do is just ask. And just for, just as a side tangent, this one's free of all, co of all cost. But as I read this story, I just want to share this with you. This is something so amazing that even Jesus needed encouragement. Do you notice that? Jesus needed encouragement from God and from his friends. You know, and as I read this, this makes me realize, you know, as a church, we need to be there for each other. Because trust me, life and the devil puts enough stuff in our life already. As a church, we need to be supporting and encouraging each other. Because my friends, if Jesus needs encouragement, how much more do you and I do? So our, third, our second lesson about being a hero for Jesus is it's not about our wisdom, but about his. And now I'd like for you to turn with me to Mark chapter 14, verses 27. Mark chapter 14, verse 27. Mark chapter 14, verse 27. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. Amen. And we're coming up to the third time that Peter was afraid. So in Mark 14, verse 27, it said, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that tonight, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more valiantly and said, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all, all the disciples, said likewise. And we know the story, don't we? What happened? Exactly. Exactly what he said he wasn't going to do, he did. And let's, let's continue. Let's read the story. Let's go to John, John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 15. John chapter 18, verse 15. Let's read the story. Don't take my word for it. Take God's. John chapter 18, verse 15. 
And it says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and, when Je and, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to, to her, who kept the door, and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And what did he say? Yes, I am? No, I'm not. Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves as Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So let's skip down to verse 12. Let's read the rest of it. It says, Now when Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And what does Peter say? He denied again. And immediately the rooster crowed. So exactly what Peter said he wouldn't do, he does. And you know, I can't help but look at my life. You know, and I hope you guys don't have the same story, but have you ever told God, God, I'm so sorry, I will never do this again? Yeah. And then what happens one month later, or maybe even one week, or one day, or even one hour later, you do it. And I, and I hope you're not like me, but when I do that, I can't help but feel like I disappoint God. You know? I'm like, God, I know I told you I wouldn't do this, but ah, I'm sorry. And you know, this kind of reminds me, you know, when growing up, you know, when you're little, and you get in trouble, it's one thing if your parents are mad at you, right? They're mad at you and they spank you because you did something wrong. But have you ever had your parents disappointed in you? You know, where you did something and, and your mom or dad come up to you and say, I'm so disappointed in you. And I don't know about you, but when they say that, I'm like, no, please be mad at me. Spank me, spank me. Because there's nothing worse than disappointing your parents. And I can just imagine for Peter, there's nothing worse than disappointing your best friend. And can you imagine how he must have felt? He must have felt as big as an ant. But you know what's so amazing? You know what's so amazing? That Jesus' love, his grace, is enough. No matter how many times we mess up, no matter how big we mess up, Jesus is there to take us back. And I want us to go and continue in the story of John. And I want us to go to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And I want us to start with verse 7. John chapter 21, verse 7. <clears throat> and it says, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garments, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. So what happened before this? The disciples, Peter, he goes to him, he says, Let's go fishing. And they say, okay, I got a fishing pole. You got a fishing pole? All right, let's go fishing. So they go out and they're going fishing and they're out all night and they catch nothing. And then there's a man on the shore who says, you know, did you catch anything? Do you have any food? And they said, no. So he said, why don't you try to catch a fish on the other side of the boat? So they do it. And as they put down their nets, their nets are so full that they're about to break, which reminds them of the first time they met Jesus. And what's so interesting, we see here that the one Jesus, the disciple who loved Jesus, or whom Jesus loved, John, says, it's Jesus. And what's so interesting is Peter does something that doesn't make sense. I have a question for you. When you go swimming, do you decrease the amount of clothing you wear or increase? You decrease, right? I never, I never told my friend, hey, let's go swimming. He's like, all right, one sec, let me get my jacket. Has that ever happened? But what does it say in verse 7 that, that Peter did? It says he puts on his outer garment and he plunges into the sea. It doesn't make sense. And my question is, could have Peter stayed on the boat 
and waited five or ten extra minutes to see Jesus. He could have, couldn't he? Kept dry, didn't have to do so much cardio. It would have been easy. But what does he do? He runs or swims to Jesus. And you know what's so amazing when I read this story? That when you and I mess up, when we say, Jesus, I promise I'm not going to do this, but then we do it. And I don't know, I hope you never feel like me, but sometimes I feel like I can't even talk to God. Like, God, I'm so sorry, I, I keep messing up. But you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to run to Jesus as fast as we can. Because no matter what we've done, Jesus is right there and says, come back to me. Come back to me, and I will take you back. And I want you to continue with me in the story. And let's go, let's skip ahead to verse 15. And let's read verse 15 to 17. And it says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And I want to continue. Let's read 18 and 19. It says, most assuredly I say to you, when you are younger, you girded yourself you walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and cure you where you do not wish. In verse 19, it says, Then this he spoke, signifying by what his death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. You know what's the most amazing thing? That no matter what we do, no matter how big we mess up, Jesus is there to save us and to restore us. But you, you want to know the interesting thing is? When G, after Jesus has saved and restored us, he says, follow me. He says, I, I don't care if you don't think you're qualified, but I want you to follow me. And has anyone here ever played Simon Says? So how does Simon Says work, right? There's one Simon even though their name might not be Simon. And whatever he does and says Simon says, everybody else has to do, right? So if they say Simon says, you know, raise your hand. Everybody has to raise their hand, right? You know what's so amazing about following Jesus? It's just like a game of Simon says. That when we follow Jesus, whatever he tells us to do, we are to do. And you know what the interesting part is? Unlike Simon says, why do we do it? Because we want to win? Because we have to? No. It's because we love Jesus. And if we love Jesus, we will feed his sheep. My friends, we have been saved to serve. And I want to, if, if you could bring up the slide, I want, to, I want to read a quote from Ellen White in Desire of Ages about the transformation that happened to Peter during this time. And, um, and it says, before his fall, Peter was always speaking unadvisedly. From the impulse of the moment, he was always ready to correct others and to express his mind before he had a clear comprehension of himself or of what he had to say. But the converted Peter was very different. He retained his former fervor, but the grace of Christ regulated his zeal. He was no longer impetuous, self-confident, or self-exalted, but calm, self-possessed, self and teachable. He could then feed the lambs as well as the sheep of Christ's flock. Jesus can transform even Peter's, so he can transform you and I. And the most amazing thing as we learned, and you, you can turn it off now, the most amazing thing that we learned is if, if we want to follow God, if we want to tell, tell him that we're going to do what we say we got to do, it's not about us. It's not about our strength, but it's about Christ living in us. Because the number one thing about being a hero is that in our own eyes, we must be a zero. 
Because perfect trust in God is only found in perfect distrust of self. When we know we are helpless, when we know we can't do anything, only then can God work through us to make miracles happen. And this is why, going back to Acts chapter, chapter 4, this is why Peter is so bold in front of the who's who's of Jerusalem. Because he knows he, he's nobody, but he knows somebody. And that somebody is Jesus Christ. And for sake of time, I just want to tell you the rest of the story. So what happens is they see Peter's boldness. But they see the man that Peter healed. And they know that they can't do anything because of the healing of this lame and crippled man. So, and they, they threaten to, to, they threaten the disciples saying, don't talk about Jesus anymore. But it doesn't work. All their threats, all their, you know, intimidation doesn't work. So finally, they got to let him go. And I want you to read with me what my Bible entitles the prayer for boldness. So turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And it reads, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them, and who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain, vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. In verse 27 it says, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. In verse 29 it says, Now Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that we all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy Spirit, servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the words of God with boldness. Amen. And I don't know about you, but this is one of those stories that when I read it, the hair in the back of my neck kind of stands up. What must it have been like for the place to be shooken and for the Holy Spirit to be in them. And you know what I believe? That this prayer, that this scenario, this circumstance, this situation right here could happen again. Amen. You know all it's going to take is for each and every one of us to no longer think that we are strong enough to do God's will. To no longer think that we of our own wisdom, of our own strength, are good enough at all. But what it's going to take is for each and every one of us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. And I don't know about you, but my greatest desire, and I've been looking at my life, my greatest desire is to be a hero for God. Isn't that yours? What would it be said that the Clearing First Church was a church full of heroes for God who are bold and courageous for Him? And this morning, Pastor Harley and I, we've been praying and talking because we want to be bold for God. You know, like what Pastor Harley said, we want to think big like God. And we need your help. Because as we've been praying, as we've been talking, we made a decision. And this is outside our comfort zone. So we need your help. But by faith, you know what we're going to do? Every first Sabbath of the month, we're going to fill the baptistry. Every first Sabbath of the month, every single month, we're going to fill the baptistry. Who's going to be in there? We don't know. But you know what? We know God knows. And I'll be honest, for both Pastor Harley and I, this is a step of faith. We're, we're kind of scared about this. We don't know where to go, but we're trusting in God. And this morning, I'd like to challenge you. From our very beginning, 
our very beginning challenge was for each and every family to bring one person to Jesus. And you know what? I want to invite you to continue on this journey. Will you join us in being about God's business and about bringing people to know their one and only Savior and best friend, Jesus Christ? This morning, will you help us on your knees praying for the people that should be in there? I know each and every single one of us, maybe even you, know someone who should be there, who haven't given their life to Jesus. And our prayer is that as together as a church, that we can be about his business and bring the people who need to know Jesus into a relationship with their Lord and Savior. Amen. Would you be willing to help us with this? Would you be willing to pray for us to tell your friends about Jesus? Would you be willing to do that? Amen. If you would, would you please stand with me for prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, our God, Lord, we know that we are nothing, but that, Lord, you are everything. And, Lord, today we want to pray a prayer like the disciples for boldness, Lord. Lord, may each and every one of us be a hero for you. May we not be afraid of this world, about the struggles of life, about persecution or death, but, Lord, may we be focused on you and you alone, and may every day, may we give our lives to you, Lord. Lord God, we know that there are people in this community, there are people in our families, people in our neighborhood that need to know about you. And Lord, today we know that our strength is not enough. And Lord, it is our prayer that you give us the strength, that you give us your Holy Spirit so that we can bring this world closer to you, Lord. And that, Lord, soon and very soon you can come back. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.